Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. And it's nice to see all of you there. And Kelly says uh, it's minus 40 where he is. Minus 50, yeah, that's it with the wind chill. I, I don't care about wind chill, but it's going to be uh, minus 50 here tomorrow night. So, so we have some cold weather. What do you mean you don't care about the wind chill? Because I, I don't People, wind chill. I don't have my wind. Skin wind. Oh, I see. Wind, but however, wind chill, wind chill does require extra clothing. Even, but even the slightest one—that's when. What people don't understand about wind chill, a five mile, five kilometer, the slightest wind is like, you're going to cut your fingers off. <laughs> oh, I know. You know, I it's know. to get so cold, you know. The I, always, I always dress. Anyway, I, I just thought I'd send that. Did you see the picture of the tower with the snowflakes? No. On my Facebook post? Oh, yeah, yeah. Some other, some other, some other time, but this, this phone is just amazing. And also living here is just even better. It's a dream. It's, it's God's blessing. I'm so happy. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, we're going to pray. So, dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the time that we have to study. We're thankful for the Sabbath. And uh, here up in the great white north, we're thankful for our warm homes. And we're thankful for the warm fellowship that we can have with one another. We know, Lord, that um, we are dependent upon you in all things, and we're dependent upon you to understand your word, that the same Holy Spirit that inspired it is in, is required to understand it. And so we ask for your spirit to be here as we study together. I pray for each person searching for truth, that you can encourage them, that you can help them, and that you can help us in our mission ministry to others that we can reflect your character and we ask for your angels care and protection upon our loved ones and that your holy spirit can speak to them help us to be an influence and um, we ask lord that uh, you can be with us in this study tonight that we can see things uh, clearly and that they can reach into the heart and that we can feel the conviction of sin, but also your power uh, to aid us and to give us strength that we may uh, reflect Christ's character. Thank you for this time. And we pray and ask in Jesus name. Amen. <clears throat> OK, well. So we're going to look at. uh we're going to take our time to go through G.I. Butler's book. I mean, we took time to go through A.T. Jones and, he, um, and the 1888 uh, um, re-examined. But I really think that we need to look at this issue because we, we've been going through the history of 1888 and the reaction. But I really want to look at, at one of the main issues about 1888 and why it's important. Um, now, this is a book by G.I. Butler. He's the uh, General Conference president at the time. And he is one of those, uh, you know, uh, titles. But we don't use titles like this anymore. But is it the moral law or does it refer to that system of laws peculiarly Jewish? Dealing with the law in Galatians, right? So um, that's the law in the book of Galatians. Is it the moral law, right? So the question is being asked. So that's the title of the book. And in 1886. Now, <clears throat> so we have to remember we're reading things that uh, we may not necessarily agree with, but we want to understand what G.I. Butler is saying and why he's saying it. And um, we know one of the things Ellen White says about this history is that you preach the law until it's as high, dry as the hills of Gilboa or something like that. Um, Adventists were a debating group at this time. They liked to have debates with other churches to prove that, um, you know, the Sabbath was still binding upon people. And, and so a lot of this discussion or the view that Butler has has to do with 
uh, this sort of apologetics. So it's a position that was taken primarily because it worked well in arguments. And and you can see that they tend to have a bit of a debate of spirit. They always try to act like they're not really debating. But, I mean, uh, they use a little bit of, um, you know, sarcasm here and there, both Butler and Wagner. <clears throat> so what law is the principal subject of the apostles' discourse in the epistle to the Galatians? Is it the moral law? or the typical remedial system and laws particular, peculiarly, I can never say that word, peculiarly Jewish. Perhaps there has never been a theological question in all the history of our work concerning which there has been so much disagreement among our ministry and leading brethren as this. Such differences have existed more or less with varying phases. Since, says Singe there, but it's since the rise of the message, and at times have been discussed with more or less warmth. At other periods, they have been tacitly left um, untouched. Generally, a mutual forbearance has been exercised so that bitterness of feeling between brethren has been avoided. So one of the things we know is there was a disagreement earlier on and one of the persons who had taken the position that the law in Galatians was the moral law and not the ceremonial law was E.J. Wagner's dad, right? So that's what he's sort of referring to here. Uh, leading brethren have been on both sides of the question. In the early history of the work, it is probable that quite a majority of them accepted the view that the moral law was the main subject of Paul's consideration in the book of Galatians. But there came quite a change in this respect at a later period when some of our leading brethren to whom our people have ever looked as safe counselors in questions of perplexity gave up the view that the moral law was mainly under discussion and took the position that it was the ceremonial law. Now, I love how, um, you know, I should, I mean, being a bit sarcastic, but, I mean, there is this way in which you can see the emotionally charged language and the rhetoric that's being used, right? You know, to whom are people ever looked as safe counselors in questions of perplexity? That's that's the leading brethren that we have to listen to. And, and there's always this setup in this way. And I don't think, and, and Wagner does some of the same things, and I don't think those are wise ways to communicate, that is, when we write, when we're discussing something, when we're having a point of view, we're discussing something from the Bible, I, I'm not a fan of rhetoric, you know, rhetoric, especially rhetoric that that is meant to bias the person on some position. But we see it all the time, um, that we should we should present the truth in God's word in just the most simple and straightforward manner possible without without this emotional sort of language and this this sort of um undercurrent of uh of opposition right um and and it's it's really i, I would say to some degree it's a type of disrespect um I, I would not like it if somebody communicated with me that way and i don't think i would want to communicate with somebody that way <clears throat> okay, many others who have come later in, to act a part in the work have accepted the latter view with strong confidence. It would be quite difficult to ascertain the comparative strength in numbers on either side, but to the best of the writer's judgment and his opportunities of forming a fair opinion have not been meager. Uh, he would say that at the present time, at least two-thirds of our ministers hold the latter opinion, right? So the latter being... Um, uh, the position that the law in Galatians is the ceremonial law. For half a score of years past, the question has lain quite dormant. Not that either of the classes referred to have changed their opinion, by no means, uh, but there has seemed to be an avoidance of the question quite largely and a desire to spare the feelings of those who hold an opposite view as much as possible. 
so that the law in Galatians has not been dwelt upon in articles coming before the public through our periodicals and publications as much as it otherwise would have been. Now, of course, um, when you have an issue that is is controverted in this way, you know, something that, that there's disagreement on, definitely I don't think the place to have that debate is in the public papers. Um, and that was one of the objections that Butler had, is that Jones and Wagner in The Signs of the Times, which was uh, an evangelical paper, that is a paper that was used for evangelism, um, that they would present this this view on the law in Galatians that it was the moral law being referred to. And, and they felt that that shouldn't be happening. So that's why he's talking about this. Um, and, and he's trying to show that, you know, they've been moderate and we haven't really gone into debate. And now the problem is really on those who write the signs of the times, as we'll see in the next paragraph. We say this has been the case quite largely until within a comparatively brief time. But the writer acknowledges considerable surprise that during the last year or two, the subject has been made quite prominent in the instructions given to those at Healdsburg College preparing to labor in the cause, also in the lessons passing through the instructor designed for our Sabbath schools all over the land, and in numerous argumentative articles in the Signs of the Times, our pioneer missionary paper, thus throwing these views largely before the reading public not acquainted with our faith. Thus, strong and repeated efforts have been made to sustain the view that the moral law is the subject of the apostles' discourse in the most prominent texts under discussion in the letter to the Galatians. So you can see why he's upset about this. In, in his view, this shouldn't have happened. It's, it's a minority view. Only one third of our ministers hold to this view. We shouldn't be, uh, you know, agitating this issue. Now, we are not disposed to find fault with the spirit in which the articles are written, even though he said they were argumentative, or to say that the matter has not been managed ably on the part of those engaged in it. Indeed, we are free to admit a keen perception, yea, a degree of admiration of the tact and ability displayed in bringing this controverted question of long standing, held in abeyance for a time, uh, before our people in the manner mentioned. It shows a degree of shrewdness in planning to carry the views of the writers and actors, which, if exerted in a better way, might be truly commendable. So you can see he, he's critical, but in a very underhanded way. Right? Even this idea of shrewdness. Right? So he, he's kind of um, flattering them on the one hand or saying good things, but but in an underhanded way, I guess it's like a backhanded comment. Um, but we must decidedly protest against the bringing out of contributed views in the manner indicated concerning matters upon which our people are not agreed. It violates a principle well understood in the practice of this body, which has usually been regarded with respect. It has been taught by high authority that where such differences exist, at least on the side of a minority, they should either be held without giving them much publicity or be brought before our leading brethren and acted upon by them. Then it would be time to publish them and not before. Now, does this kind of sound a little bit like what we heard from the church regarding the 2520? Does it sound familiar? Yeah, seems to, yeah. Yeah, and it's, you know, you need to bring it before the leading brethren. And if they don't see any light in it, you need to just set it aside, right? And, yeah. and there, there is a truth to that, bringing things before the leading brethren. Um, but in, in this case, often it's just because they've already decided they don't want to hear it. And it's just an excuse so that they can stop us from presenting, uh, something that if, if people hear it, they might accept and they might, they might see the truthfulness of it. So they're not really interested in studying it truly. And, and I believe that was the issue here at this time. But even if we were thought consistent to publish controverted views to a reasonable degree, we should still protest against doing it in the manner mentioned. 
it seems very objectionable to us to urgently teach views not held by a majority of our leading brethren to our college students who are preparing to go out and labor in the cause, right? And it's like, oh, you guys are presenting the 2520 to new converts. I mean, I, I just see the parallel, so that's where I'm going on that. But, I mean, the question here is, um, would this issue ever have been studied, you know, if it hadn't been agitated at that time? We do not believe our denominational institutions of learning were established for any such purpose. Our work has been noted for unity, but unity will not be increased by such methods. There are plenty of things which can be taught without going into controverted fields. We can see that the fact that such differences have been made prominent in teaching these young minds must tend to give them a less favorable impression of the character of our work than if effort had been made to make our differences as small as possible. Um, so the lessons going through the instructor in which those points have been presented. So of the lessons going through the instructor. So the same thing applies. Uh, to our personal knowledge and from the reports of leading ministers in many places throughout the field, a great amount of argument and controversy has been indulged in over this question of the law in Galatians often with heat and contention. When such positions are taken on controverted points, the fact that they are published in our denominational journals, and hence are believed to be the views of all our people, leaves an unjust impression in the minds of those who study the lessons, concerning the larger number of those in the cause who hold opposite views. It is taking an unfair advantage. Our Sabbath school lesson should teach only views held by the large body of our, our people. Uh, the same principle applies to articles published in our pioneer paper. They should represent only the views of the body and not ventilate views held by any writer, however strongly he may hold them, um, when he knows they are not the views of the body or the principal portion of our people. To pursue the opposite course would be far more objectionable in our pioneer paper than in the review, the organ of the church. The former was established by our people as an agency through which to introduce our views to the public. who are supposed to be unacquainted with them. Everyone would have the strongest reason to suppose that articles coming from the pioneer paper of the denomination established by the church to teach its special views were endorsed by the body. But such is not the case with the articles in question. Uh, the application of texts in Galatians quoted and commented upon in the signs is not the opinion of the body or a majority of our people, and has not been for years. And those writing them certainly ought to know this. The Signs is a paper with a large circulation. It comes under the observation of many of our ablest of opponents. By this course, the managers of the Signs, they must become aware of the fact that there is a difference in our public teaching upon this subject, and they will doubtless use such knowledge to our detriment. Indeed, I have known it to be done years in the past by an able disputant in a debate in Iowa who brought out the fact that we teach differently on this subject. And um, so you can see the kind of underlying uh, issues here. This is about uh, what the other churches think of us. And, you know, if I'm doing a debate and somebody says, well, you take this position, but there's other people in your church who hold another position, it, it it makes it awkward, I guess, is probably what you say. Uh, we claim to be a united people and to teach but one doctrine. It has been a great cause of regret for years among our best brethren that this difference of opinion exists among us. And the course of the signs must tend to make this difference far more prominent than it ever has been before. And many outside of our ranks will become acquainted with the fact, who never would have known it, had not the editors of the signs repeatedly pressed their views of this subject through its columns. Whatever may be the opinion entertained concerning the subject of the law in Galatians, it seems to the writer that there can be but one opinion among the careful, thoughtful believers concerning the propriety of publishing in our pioneer paper doctrines not generally held by the large majority of the people. And one of the things when I think about this, 
I mean, to me, this is what I would call a doctrine. When, when we study the scriptures, there would probably be lots of scriptures that different people would have different views on. And, and I don't know, you know, in, in the context of just the law in Galatians, in its sort of, in the way that Butler is addressing it. I personally don't see what the problem would be. Just, you know, different people might have different views about how to understand some verses, especially in Galatians. But he's making it as a huge issue because there is another issue or other issues that are being affected by it. So one, of course, it has to do with church authority, has to do with, um, you know, keeping things in line. Um, but also, you're going to see it's going to come down to the whole doctrine of righteousness by faith. So for Butler, the issue is not about righteousness by faith. The issue is about the law in Galatians. And, and this is what we see in, in the history when people talk about 1888. Uh, you know, it's about, well, which law is it? And, and there was this argument over the law in Galatians. But as you'll see when we go through this, and then we look at, at Wagner's review of this book, that the issue really was about the nature of Christ. The law in Galatians was just the surface issue. It was the, oh, what do you call that? I can't think of the word. But it, it, it's just the point that, that they believed that they were arguing about, at least Butler did, right? He didn't understand the implications of what it would mean if the law in Galatians is just the ceremonial law in the context of the nature of Christ and in the context of um, righteousness by faith, right? So that that that's really where the issue is. But we're going to see that he's going to be dealing with this surface issue as if it is the problem, but you're going to see eventually in this discussion where where the real issue is. Okay, so he says, believing strongly as we do that the law principally considered in Galatians is the typical remedial system which passed away at the cross and is not the moral law and feeling that an unfair advantage has been taken in urgently teaching the contrary opinion to our young people preparing to labor in the cause and in making our instructor lessons and pioneer paper mediums for teaching an opposite view and hoping to add some information which will be valuable upon the subject, we have felt it not only proper, but a duty to bring the subject before the general conference of our people, the only tribunal uh, in our body where such controverted questions can be properly considered and passed down. <clears throat> now, um, now, of course, we're, we're still looking at this history in 1888, but we're thinking about how this affects us, how this has affected our movement. Now, um, we have seen it, of course, with the church has treated us in regard to the 2520. Um, and not many people would have experienced what, what I experienced when it came to July 18th and what Stephen experienced and Odilio and John Mark, um, where basically it was, we just had to forget about our ideas and and just do what the church said. I mean, FFA said, right? The elders said there's no light in July 18th. And even Jeff had to bow to that back in uh, 2018. Right. So, and, and then that's going to be pressed. All What's that? Hand up. Uh, <laughs> um, jumping in. You were saying something about. What was it? Just listen to what the leaders have to say, and that was uh, the man, mm -hmm. you know, otherwise heads will roll sort of thing. And they were rolling. I mean, 25-20, there is so much disfellowshipping, et cetera. Not, not, actually not a lot of disfellowshipping, but a lot of attempted discipline. Yeah, and, and um, is, instead of just saying, hey, let's, that. let's study it out, right? Because even with... Yeah, or even or even staying, let's study it out, and then not really. I like right. one pastor when I showed him the timeline, said to me, um, "Wow, 
that's really good. It, it, how it proves 1844, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is God's church in, called into existence through prophecy or from prophecy. But uh, he said, that's really, that's really good. He says, that's really convenient. I wish I could use that in a revelation seminar. <laughs> he was impressed, admitted how amazing it was, and, you know, couldn't be. And here's the other thing I had in mind before I go, was uh, the, the thing about leadership wanting submission to their judgment. Um, from my personal experience, I, I, I could not, I, I just thought this, so I had to say it, but I couldn't bow, bow the knee and kiss the ring. And that's what they were asking. Yeah. And, and we have the same thing in this movement, right? So, I mean, my view has always been that if somebody says something, it doesn't matter who they are, um, and, but they, they have some view. I'm going to look at it and study it out for myself. And, um, and I think that every Seventh-day Adventist should have that ability to decide for themselves what is truth. When you have the church sort of trying to shield, you know, um, new members, you know, all these different excuses of why we can't even discuss this issue, um, because it's obviously wrong. People have looked into it. It's decided it's error. Um, and you just have to accept that. I mean, that is papal, right? But the church does not benefit by that. And, and the way that we have always dealt with people who had strange ideas in Warburg, a uh, church which I, I went to for years, um, was just basically, okay, you believe some different idea, that's fine. We'll listen to what you have to say. Um, and, and, and sometimes the fact that we didn't get upset about it meant that they just didn't want to have anything to do with us because many people wanted us to be upset. Right. So so but there's the two kind of classes in the general sense. There was those who were just trying to stir up trouble. And if they couldn't stir up trouble, well, then they'd go someplace where they could. And then there was the other ones. They just, you know, they would share what they had to say. And over time, they would just set it aside because, you know, we didn't have to argue with them and prove them wrong. We just treated them well. Um, and. You know, so many things, so many problems in the church uh, could be solved, not by argument, but by just listening to one another and studying together in a proper spirit. And that could happen in this movement as well. Right. So, you know, there's we're not to have a debate of spirit, a debate of combative spirit, a debating spirit. We need to be able to listen to one another and to learn. Right. And so sometimes we're wrong. That's fine, right? Sometimes person's wrong. Well, that's fine too. It doesn't mean that person's evil or bad or needs to be treated poorly. Okay, so thanks for that comment there, uh, Kelly. Okay, as a people, we believe there are two laws or systems of law, the moral law and the principles of moral duty which grow out of it. The ceremonial law embracing the typical remedial system pointing forward to Christ and the civil laws growing out of the special relation existing between God and the Jewish people to the cross. We hold the former to be ever binding upon man while the latter passed away. So now there is this sort of distinction between the moral and ceremonial law. Um, I don't think is, is actually a fair distinction. It, it sounds okay on the surface, but there is lots in the ceremonial law, uh, that is moral, lots that is typical, um, but really the moral law sort of pervades the ceremonial law that they're that they're connected. We, we'll we'll see that as we go through this study. Um, our inquiry is now as to which of these laws the apostle has principally in view in the letter to the Galatians. The question is an important one. It is therefore well worthy of consideration. Truth, for its own sake, is important concerning the meaning and application of any scripture. And the truth concerning the law in Galatians is especially so because the apostles' references to the law in this letter 
are used by our opponents as a strong support of their antinomian doctrines. So he's saying these other churches who have done away with the law, um, they use the idea that the law in Galatians is the moral law as an attack upon the moral law. Right. So he's saying if, if, if we get the wrong view, we're not going to be able to argue against them. It is evident that the position which is a truthful exposition of the apostle's argument is in every way preferable and will be easier to defend than one which is erroneous. Um, and that is, of course, true. Um, but he's assuming the one that's erroneous is that the law in Galatians is the moral law. It will enable us to meet our opponents more successfully and thus the great system of truth which we hold will be strengthened. All our people ought to greatly desire that we come to a unity of position on this subject. Now, my experience with understanding the law of Galatians in dealing with other Christians is that when you understand that the law of Galatians is the moral law, it is way more powerful to present the gospel and um, and to win people over, so to speak, to the truth, then if you take the position that the law in Galatians is the ceremonial law that is done away with, right? So, so if you're saying, well, it's the ceremonial law that we're no longer under, um, you could, he's saying, well, this is one of our main ways in which we argue against people. They take the position as the moral law. We're not under the moral law. And so we just say it's the ceremonial law and we can win the argument. But actually, you don't win the person because the truth is more powerful and more effective than error. And I found this in my own personal understanding when I used to believe that the law in Galatians was the ceremonial law. There was no power in in discussing with people the book of Galatians. But when I understood it was the moral law, there was power in it. So it is true. Something's easier to defend when it is true than when it is error. We hold that the letter to the Galatians was written to meet one of the greatest difficulties with which the gospel had to contend in the apostles' day. This difficulty was the opposition of Judaizing teachers and disciples who still taught the obligation of the ceremonial law and of circumcision and those laws connected with it which served to separate between Jews and Gentiles. These confused the minds of the disciples and obscured the great principles of the gospel, virtually destroying it. We find constant reference um, to the work of the class of teachers in Paul's writings and in the Acts of the Apostles, as we shall see. Indeed, it may well be doubted whether a large portion of the early church who were Jews before conversion ever fully realized the scope and extent of the gospel in setting aside those laws peculiarly Jewish. They clung to them and were zealous for them long after they were abolished at the cross. To Paul, we are in debt through the blessing of God for the only full explanation of the proper relation of these laws to the plan of salvation in the gospel. And he himself was looked upon with great suspicion by many of the Hebrew converts because he plainly taught the abrogation of many things which they continued to hold sacred. Now, this paragraph here sounds reasonable, right? The idea is, look at Galatians, when you read it, there's people who've come in and they're teaching you to observe things that are not required. And, and so that the whole issue of this book is just to say, look, we're not under the law. We're not under the ceremonial law. That, that's the position that Butler takes. But it's actually much more nuanced than that. The problem um, of why this was an issue. Because it was, it was a, a problem of understanding righteousness by faith. The problem really was a similar problem to what they had in 1888 and what we have had in humanity. So, so we'll see what we mean by that as we go through this. He says, nor is this to be wondered at when we take a view of the past history of that people and the special influences which had been at work for 15 centuries. We cannot well realize the peculiar circumstances surrounding the early church 
and the special influences with which they had to contend without looking at the causes which led to them. We will briefly notice these. Because the mass of mankind had gone into idolatry and utterly apostatized from God, uh, the Lord chose Abraham and his descendants to be his peculiar people. They were still, they were such till the cross. He gave them the right of circumcision, a circle cut in the flesh as a sign of their separation from the rest of the human family. In process of time, after special experiences and training, he gave them a land peculiarly their own and built about them by special laws, ordinances, rites, and services. A wall of separation, which has made them a distinct people even to the present day. The sign of circumcision to the Jew implied and embraced all this. It was the one right which separated the Jew from the Gentile world. This is shown by the fact that any Gentile could become a proselyte and be entitled uh, to all the privileges of the nation by being circumcised and uniting with them. Without this, in the old economy, no man could come under the provisions of salvation with it. Um, with it, all the hopes, promises, covenants, laws, light, and privileges of the Israelite were his. Hence, circumcision implies all those privileges, especially Jewish. But the term was used in this well-understood sense. The circumcised were God's peculiar people. The uncircumcised were all the rest of the world. Hence, for a man to drop circumcision was really to cast aside all the peculiar blessings and privileges of the Jews and to lower himself to a level with the rest of the world he so much despised, while to maintain it was to maintain all he supposed, his supposed superiority. Hence, we see what was involved in the controversies over circumcision in the early gospel church. Now, again, this sounds reasonable until we really start to look at the issues that was happening to the Galatians, why um, why Paul takes the position that he does and why Jones and Wagner took the position that they did um, regarding the law in Galatians being the moral law. But you can see this sort of, and, and, and I, I don't mean to use the word to sort of be derogatory, but it, it's, it's a simplistic view um, that he is using here. It seems reasonable, right? You got these Judaizers coming in, they're wanting them to be circumcised. So Paul's letter is just saying, you don't need to be circumcised because we're not under the law, right? That's that's a Jewish law, okay? The other thing we would see with Butler is he he has his reasons. He has built up his case. He's thought about this and, and and is is building his argument. Um, and I shouldn't say building his argument. He's stating his argument. That is, he hasn't really shown this yet, right? He is stating what he believes. Um, but he hasn't given us the evidence from Scripture to show this, right? So it is his belief system. But he hasn't shown us why this is correct. He's just stating it as if it is true. And you're going to see that Wagner is always going to be using biblical arguments. Now, Butler is going to use some too. He's going to use some verses and so forth. But a lot of this background, this sort of foundation that he has on how he is interpreting the book in Galatians, he has he doesn't really prove it. This is his assumed body of knowledge that he's now applying to something. And so we always have to be careful when it comes to uh, what, what we believe, because there are things we believe that we've never examined, right? We've never spent the time. They're just they're just a given, right? It's like obviously everybody understands it this way, and so that worldview or whatever you want to call it, it could even be a, you know smaller perspective. It colors what we read and how we interpret what we read, and so we should be aware of that. And and Butler isn't aware of this. He isn't aware of, of the problems with his thinking about the untruthfulness of some of his assumptions. And, and Wagner is going to address many of those assumptions. <clears throat> uh, Butler goes on, he says, um, should we inquire into the reasons why God has thus separated the descendants of Abraham from the rest of the world as the right of circumcision implied? 
we may readily discover them. Every effort of the Almighty to maintain a pure people in the earth had in length of time seemed to fail. At the flood, all had gone astray, save Noah and his family, and the destruction of the mass of the race thus became necessary in order to start anew. Another great defection made the destruction of the cities of the plain necessary. Scarce any but Abraham remained true to their allegiance uh, at this t- at his time, in his time. Uh, so God now adopts a more effectual method. He takes the painful rite of circumcision as a separating sign and builds a wall around his people, protecting them in a measure from the inundation of evil coming from the outer heathen world, thus preserving a seed at church till Messiah should come and inaugurate a more effective system with which to bless mankind. The object was noble and su- as such and such as was worthy of a wise benevolent creator. Now, I have a lot of problems with what he's saying here. So why were the Jews given circumcision? What was the reason? Now, he says it's a separating sign, and that's partly true. Um, but he's using the wrong meaning of the word separation. Wasn't it to to have it be more as a sign of a covenant? Right. And 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 this separation is not to separate them from all peoples, but it's actually setting them aside for a holy purpose. It's it's in a sense a type of sanctification. Right? Correct. Right? And the reason see in, in the the religions around them, the ones who were circumcised were the priests. So when God was having his, you know, all of the males to be circumcised. He was saying that all of you are priests. I have a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, right? That's that's really what this is about. And this isn't to cause this separation, this wall from other people. Um, that's something the Jews did later um, in the time of Christ. They took all of these things and made them as a way of separating themselves from other people. But that wasn't the intent of circumcision. It was not to be a separating sign in that sense. Um, and and then it's also like, well, God has all these systems. He tries them out. They don't work. But, he, you know, he's wise and benevolent. But all of these things fail. So, and that's not really, uh, to me, this is not really representing what God is doing. This this is sort of looking at things from I, I don't I don't know the word but basically from um, an outside God wanted to work on the heart and it's like God sets up this system uh, uh, He needs a more effective system right I mean that, I just don't think that this is appropriate what He's saying I mean it, it misrepresents God for one. But it just misrepresents the whole the whole purpose in who the Jews were. It, it's looking at the Jews from the eyes of how the Jews saw themselves in the time of Christ, not from how God looked at things when He was doing these things initially, when He was giving in these these laws. Now, the other thing about circumcision was it given when God gave them the ceremonial law? No. No, it's something that pre-exists the ceremonial law, the book of Moses, right? I mean, this, this goes back to Abraham. So, so there's that other problem that he has here in that he's, he's taking something that was given to Abraham and he's saying, well, you know, we have this painful rite of circumcision, but this is not the ceremonial law, right? God is using this as He's giving them now later on. It's going to be in it, uh, um, you know, put into the law of Moses, right? But this is something that predates the law of Moses, and 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 so its purpose is is really a sign, as Dwight said, of the covenant that God had made with Abraham, right? It's it's a symbol of death to self. Right. Of not trusting in the flesh. So baptism is going to fulfill that role of circumcision in the Christian church. It's going to be basically the same sign. 
Okay, this people thus protected were made the recipients of numberless blessings. God entrusted to them his holy law with his holy Sabbath, inestimable, inestimable blessings, which gave them an infinitely clearer view of moral duty than was um, possessed by the most enlightened nations around them. He made rich provisions for their temporal good in the fertile country bestowed upon them. Um, had they been obedient, he would have made them the highest of the nations. He gave them rich promises, instructed them by holy prophets, and caused the Messiah to be made manifest through their race. They were, indeed, a most favored nation. But these great blessings, which should have made Israel a humble, grateful people, full of love to God, they perverted and became proud, boastful, supercilious, stiff-necked, and selfish, looking down upon all others and feeling that they were the only ones God regarded. They filled up the measure of their iniquity by crucifying their long-promised Messiah. So selfish were they that they could not appreciate the spirit of love to all, which so overflowed from his precious life. So you can see here I mean, that, that the ceremonial law, the offerings and all these things were perverted by the Jews later, uh, you know, is definitely clear. Um, but that doesn't give a reason why the ceremonial law itself uh, would be done away. And he's not describing the purpose of the ceremonial law here correctly. Um, so it's it's kind of a little bit too uh, sweeping and um, uh, in the way that he's he's sort of looking at this history, this whole history all the way from Abraham to the cross. It's just it's not. It's not detailed enough. It's too broad a brush. Anyway, then came the cross when all their special privileges with circumcision as their representative and sign were swept away. They had forfeited them by disobedience and rebellion. The time and event, the limit to which they reached had come. Their iniquity in view of the light they had received was even greater than that of the nations around them. There was no propriety, therefore, and still keeping up the wall of separation between them and others, they stood now upon the same level in the sight of God, almost approach him through the Messiah who had come into the world. Through him alone could man be saved. Okay, so you can see here, this is quite a distorted view of, of what happened with the Israelites. Um, and uh, Angela just puts a note dealing with circumcision. She finds it interesting that the command to circumcise is first given in Genesis 1711. As we know, 17 times 11 is 187. Thanks for that little observation there. Um, so there was nothing wrong with circumcision, right? God did not make a mistake in giving circumcision. God did not make a mistake in giving the ceremonial law. God did not make a mistake in making a covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, or with with the Israelites at, at Mount Sinai, right? God's purposes are being worked out. These symbols have their place and purpose, not the purpose that he thinks that Butler is sta- saying here. And it's not like they lost this privilege because they crucified Christ. They, you know, it's not really how I would look at it. Um, Actually, his view is something that's I've never I've never seen anything like this in the spirit of prophecy regarding um, the Israelites or circumcision or the law of Moses. Right. So it's I, I don't know how to describe his view. Um, all I can say is from from reading Butler when I read Butler. And, and I, you know, I don't know the guy personally because you know, he passed away before I was born, but, um, I don't get an impression from him that he's a very spiritual man. And, you know, I can't judge him, right? But there are writers when they write that they have insight that, that strikes you, right? That you, you see something, you, and it, and it brings a conviction upon you. Like Sister White. Yeah, like Sister White. 
or Jones and Wagner and, and lots of other writers that yeah. I've read. Yeah. They're spiritual writers, you know, even if they, you know, especially some of the old um, Puritan authors like uh, uh, John Owen, for instance. I mean, when you read him, you feel under the conviction of the power of, of God, right? Or even Kyle uh, Mather. Who? What? What? Cotton Mather. Cotton Mather? Cotton Mather. Cotton Ma- I don't know who that is. Okay. So just some writer you know? It's an old Puritan. Ah. Author. It's not that I've read. I haven't read him. But yeah, but you, you understand what I'm saying. There are some writers, they have deep spiritual insight. Even some of the, the old commentaries. There's sometimes the insight that they have. Uh, you can see that they're spiritual men. But here, and, and, and so this is just me. Maybe it's, you know, I'm a different type of person. But he doesn't seem to have deep spiritual insight into this issue. And, and you know, I could see when Ellen White says you've been preaching the law until it's dry as the hills of Gilboa. That's sort of what I feel like when I read uh, G.I. Butler is it's it's dry it's devoid of the spirit of the of the latter and former reign right he, he's arguing an idea something on an intellectual level but he's not really understanding the heart of the issue and and i think one of the reasons that jones and wagner uh, were threatening that are threatening to people like that is it actually exposes their lack of spirituality. But, you know, that's that's just my view. I could be wrong. Okay, so um, it's 8 o'clock, so that's where we're going to stop. We're going to take our time with this. Um, Question? Yeah. What did G.I. Butler get? What, would, what did G.I. Butler get in hot water for? He, was he a general conference president? And was he the one that said, said he shouldn't be, or? Um, Miss Memory. Well, he he should have been, yes. He was the General Conference President. Um, He also wrote a series of articles. um, I believe it was him dealing with uh, which parts of the Bible are inspired and which parts aren't. Correct? That is correct. That's right. He teamed up with someone else, did he? That that was kind of going on at that. No, Jerry Butler was the one, what was the Bible? What was inspired, what wasn't, and then the other one was someone tearing apart the spirit of prophecy, was it? Or um, basically, he was he was really a pro. A. G. Daniels. Yeah, A. G. Daniels a bit later, but um, yeah. So, so with with G. I. Butler, I mean, so part of the reason why he attacks the scriptures the way that he does, where he can decide what's inspired and what's not inspired. Ellen White's going to rebuke him on that, saying that he's not inspired. Um, uh, his statements were not inspired in in, in stating that. Um, but he's he's he just does not appear to be a person who has a lot of spiritual insight, and part of that would be his lack of submission to the Word of God and to the Spirit of prophecy. Because when we put ourselves above God's word, deciding what's inspired and what's not inspired, um, we're in a very dangerous position. Um, Ellen White said that the attitude of most in the 1888 General Conference session was indeed akin to ancient Israel in Christ's time. And had Christ appeared to the church in person, they would have crucified him afresh. And, and the reason why that happens, and now, when we look at this, when we look at this issue here with Butler, we're, we're, I'm not wanting to look at Butler and say, uh, you know, here's this terrible person, right? What, what we need to recognize is things within ourselves. If we're, if we are in any way resistant to the, to the Holy Spirit, resistant to God's word, resistant to the spirit of prophets, resistant to counsel that comes from God, um, we can get caught up in this sort of intellectual way of, of 
putting ourselves above that council. And that's what I believe that Butler is doing. And, and it's something that we have to take heed ourselves. Um, how does that go again? Uh, uh, you that pointing the finger, basically thou that accuses, doest thou the same? Well, yeah, you got In three words, fingers pointing. Be ready for some self-examination if you're going to be examining others. Right. We, we should always be examining ourselves, right? It, it, I mean, it does no good if I, even if I correctly say, you know, G.I. Butler wasn't a very spiritual guy. If I'm not a spiritual guy, right? You understand what I'm saying? If I'm not, if I'm not submissive to the Bible, it doesn't help that I point out that somebody else isn't submissive to the Bible. It doesn't make me submissive to God's word just because I can point out that somebody else isn't. And so we need to be careful in how we, how we present the truth and how we um, characterize others who have different views than we do. But what I'm trying to show here with Butler is that there is this undercurrent of, in his writing that we need to guard against, that we, that we can't deal with others the way that Butler was dealing with Wagner and Jones. And, and yet we often do. And we justify. Butler's justifying everything that he's doing but he's wrong. So that justification isn't going to help. And it's not going to help us if, if we can't, if we can't be affected by God's word ourselves. So, you know, it's always easy to say, well, you know, those people who opposed in 1888, they would have crucified Christ, but we would do the same thing. So we're no better than they. Now, so I don't want these studies to go too long Friday nights. One is, it's 8 o'clock, and that's kind of my bedtime. So um, we're going to close with prayer. Uh, but tomorrow, we're going to have, of course, Dwight presenting at 9 o'clock Mountain Standard Time and me at 10. And I, I'm not sure exactly what I want to do. I do want to address some of the issues of chronology um, on on the Sabbath studies for a little bit. And my idea was to uh, study um, Ezekiel's dates and to look at some things about Ezekiel and its connection to 1888. Um, so, but I know, you know, there's other things that could be studied as well, but I'm going to use that as a starting point uh, tomorrow. So I'm going to be taking a time to do a series on, on chronology. Um, and uh, some of the details that uh, I think will be helpful for others. Um, but in all of that, you know, it's, I mean, I don't want to do something that's just dry chronology. I do want to do, I do want to, you know, continue what we've been seeing in God's word, um, especially the series that I did on love and what we've been doing on the three angels messages and what Dwight has been doing on the minor prophets that we're, we're coming in this movement to start to see um, much more clearly the why God has given us the message he's given us regarding chronology, regarding July 18th, um, regarding the lines. And, and, and a change has to happen in our lives. So, you know, so I don't want to end up doing just something that's just chronology and not you know, not um, not addressing these other issues because I think there are things that we will see there uh, that will be important. So, especially on Sabbath, I, I know that um, I did a, when I did a sermon on Ezekiel uh, back on September. Let me see what was it was November. I'm trying to think which one it was. Maybe it was the one I did September twenty third, two thousand seventeen. Um, but um, Elder Toby, he um, he sort of gave me a rebuke. He just said, you know, like you gotta you gotta bring a, a message that's gonna bring like a conviction, right? You know, this was like too much information, and it was just chronology. Um, 
And, uh, and, it, and it's true. Ellen White says that when we present a sermon, when we present a study, we need to bring it to people's, that people are being brought to Christ. And so that's something we have to think about all the time whenever we're dealing with people, not just doing sermons. But anyway, um, any final comments before we close with prayer? I want to just uh, send a photo or picture in the chat there of this yeah, one see. of the soldiers. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that to me, that picture, like I posted it and said that, that uh, we were there. Yeah. Or even the question, were you there? Yeah. Along with it. And just get people to think about that. You know, we all could have done that. Like, the, is it in the heart of man to do the worst evil, no matter how good you are? It can't and, and come do, out. And we do it against our brethren. We do it against others. Oh, we do it against God. We're hatred, yeah. hatred in our hearts without that blade, eh? Yeah, I don't know how we can mock another person and not recognize we're always mocking Christ when we do so. Yeah. Okay. Can you imagine, can you, can you imagine being a soldier and you come faced with, face with that uh, painting and the judgment? Okay, well, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath. And for the fellowship that we can have, and we ask for your continued blessing on the Sabbath. And we pray for one another. We ask, Lord, that you can use us to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.